Hey everyone, it's Susan Pierce Thompson and welcome to the weekly vlog. So a couple days ago, I had one of the most amazing experiences of my life with one of my daughters. And um, I was talking about it with my life coach, uh, Monica Leggett, and she pointed out that it would make a good vlog. And I thought, yeah, you're right. Um, a lot of us have kids or grandkids or kids in our life. And um, I gotta say that raising healthy eaters is just about the hardest thing in the world. Like it, um, it discourages me and um, saddens me and makes me feel desperate on a pretty regular basis. And the reason is this, like um, I have control over the food environment of my kids at home when they're young. But uh, even at a young age, I increasingly, like I don't have control over their food environment always when they're out if, if we're going to be a part of communities outside the home, whether it's religious communities or school communities or gymboree classes or birthday parties of other kids or play dates at other houses. So, you know, movie theaters, I mean, right, the list goes on. The zoo, the museum, right, snack bars, grocery stores with candy lining the aisles, um, airports, right? Like they're j restaurants with kids menus. Okay, don't get me started on restaurant, restaurant kid menus. <laughs> don't get me started on restaurant kid menus, okay? Like, <sighs> so what that means is that if I create a really, really buttoned up environment at home with my kids' food, um, there's going to be like a night and day difference when they go out and eat food in the world. Like the Venn diagrams just don't overlap really pretty much at all, right? Um, like zero overlap between what I would be serving at home and what they would experience on a kid's menu at a restaurant. Zero overlap between what I'd be serving at home and what they'd experience at a birthday party. Zero overlap between what I'd be serving at home and what they'd experience at a movie theater or snack bar. So... And of course, those foods taste really good, right? And their brain is going to notice the difference. They're like, there's no getting over on like, oh, that's what food can taste like. Oh, that's the hit that food could be delivering. Like, oh, yeah, baby, I want that food, right? And then you create these kids that are like, they either never want to eat at home. They just want to go out to eat or they want to go, you know, to a play date or whatever. Um, or they become sneak eaters, um, et cetera, right? Like nightmare, nightmare, right? And, you know, for me, I'm not really, just because of my own personal experience and my own personal wounds, it's not that I'm trying to raise kids that are thin. It's not that I'm trying to raise kids that are, um, I mean, God forbid, like, God help me, even healthy, right? For me. Of course I want kids who are healthy. Of course I want kids who are in a right size body. But for me, the issue is I'm trying to raise kids that are not obsessed with food. I'm trying to raise kids that aren't um, tortured by food the way I have been my whole life, right? I'm trying to raise kids that are like one of the normal ones, like one of the, like my husband, like one of these people that's just like, food is just food, right? At the end of the day, when they put their head on the pillow, they're not thinking about what they ate that day, right? Like that's what I'm trying to do. So in my home, there's been this dynamic where um, I'm a crazy hope to die food addict. My husband's a three on the susceptibility scale. I'm extreme in just about everything. I run towards bright lines like uh, I don't even know how to pronounce the word moderation. Like moderation is the point that I pass when I'm swinging from one crazy extreme to the next. And I'm going, moder what? Moder what? Like... <laughs> Like, that's moderation to me. My husband naturally gravitates toward moderation always. Like, every now and then, he'll go off on, like, a, an extreme moment. And then his system naturally, like, takes issue with that path, I guess. I don't even know how to describe it because it's not my experience. And then just naturally floats back toward the midline. That's how he rolls. Um, and he's not an extreme guy. He doesn't, like, you know... Uh, he doesn't appreciate extreme perspectives. Like in his in his world, like if someone's like uh, way out on the fringe, there's something almost inherently wrong with that, probably. Not necessarily, but probably, right? Like it's suspect. And so when I went vegan in 2012, like I read the China study and like in one day 
I went from eating yogurt and cheese every morning for breakfast and uh, beef or lamb or pork um, or turkey or chicken or salmon for every lunch and dinner, like four servings a day of straight up animal protein to none in one day on February 29th, 2012. To him, that was a little bit like, (laughs) and like I was flipped out about animal protein, like flipped out about it. Like I, it causes cancer. I'm thinking all that, you know, blah, blah, blah. If you read the China study, you'll know what I was thinking about animal protein. And um, so he was concerned and it caused some like a little bit of a moment of conflict in our marriage. And basically um, what he said is, look, I don't want to be this extreme with the kids. Like you are a grown up, Susan, you get to eat whatever you want to eat or not eat whatever you want to eat. But we're raising three daughters. I would like to still keep certain foods in the house, like eggs. Can we please keep eggs in the house still? I like to eat eggs, the kids, you know. So we had this conversation, right? And this was kind of, how old were our kids then? You know, like um, four, four, and one. Still pretty young. And um, maybe I've got, David will watch this and go, yeah, they were three, three, and one and a half, whatever. Close enough, right? Ish. Four, four, and one ish. I'm trying to do that. There's always the math of the years, but then there's the math of the months. I don't know if I'm getting it. Anyway, so um, that was sort of, it wasn't really the beginning of it, but it was it was a, a heightened point in like, I wouldn't say a rift, but like a difference. Like I was wanting to raise the kids with a certain like oomph to the like food perspective, like a certain, okay, extremism or a certain like um, philosophy, I would say. And David was kind of like, let's just keep it more on the like, easy does it, <laughs> central path, right? <sighs> And I, as a food addict, had to like reconcile all this. Like there have been a lot of times where, well, especially in restaurants where they get the kids menu and they order off the kids menu, which breaks my heart, where um, out of the sake, for the sake of convenience, for the sake of, um, yeah, expediency, for the sake of preserving unity with my husband, for the sake of not knowing a better way to do it. Because honestly, I know that if I button things up too much at home, it's just going to create a forbidden fruit effect. And, uh, you know, I'm going to turn my kids into sneak eaters and even more food addicts because their their brains are going to flip out when they get that food outside the house. I just didn't know a better way to do it. All throughout this time, Ellen Satter's Division of Responsibility has been incredibly helpful. If you don't know what I'm talking about, read my book. I talk all about it in there. But it pretty much saved us, that Division of Responsibility. It was one thing that my husband and I could really agree on, was that we provide the food at mealtimes, and then they decide whether and how much to eat from what we provide. And we have hands off. We're not trying to force them to eat it. Nobody came to like vegetables by being forced to eat vegetables. We're clear on that. So... We provide the food at mealtimes. They decide whether and how much to eat from what's provided. And since I've always done the cooking in the house, you know, I had a lot of, and the grocery shopping, I've had a lot of say over what the foods are anyway, right? All this time, I've been thinking in the back of my head and teaching you guys because people have asked me questions. What do I do about my 13-year-old kids, my 18-year-old kids? Is bright line eating appropriate for kids? I've been answering these questions. And what I always say is, no, bright line eating is not appropriate for kids. Bright line eating is appropriate for sentient adults or like people who are old enough to have an opinion for themselves who decide they want to do it. Bright line eating is not a program for people who need it. It's a program for people who want it and are willing to work it. And so that means if you got a 12 year old, unless they're saying, mommy, please, 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 can I do bright line eating? Don't keep it from me. I feel like I need to do it. Unless they're saying that, it's not for them. And even then check with their pediatrician and like make sure, you know, like even then, right? So I've been thinking in the back of my brain with my own kids, When they're old enough, maybe they'll develop an interest in what I do with my food or nutrition or whatever. So here's what came down in my house um, a few days ago. When was this? Anyway, a few days ago, Monday. (sighs) Um, I was making pancakes in the morning for my kids. 
We have pancakes and waffles all the time at my house. They're high protein, they're whole grain, um, and they're pancakes. But they're not food addicts, and I don't eat them, right? I'm making pancakes for my kids. Um, and we just bought some real butter, which we don't normally have in the house. We normally use Earth Balance Buttery Spud, but we just bought some real butter for some recipe, and we had some left over, so I was making the pancakes with real butter. And Alexis, my daughter who wants to be a chef, said, Mommy, can we always cook the pancakes in butter? Because this tastes so much better. And I said, well, only I would be willing to do that only if it's grass-fed butter. This is not this is organic butter, but it's not grass-fed. And she said, what does that mean? What's the difference? And thus launched a whole discussion in my kitchen between me and my three daughters. David was golfing. About factory farms and what the natural diet of cows is and how it's not corn and soy meal and you know we didn't get into subsidies but we stopped just shy of the subsidy discussion but we were talking about how cows eat grass and how most cows aren't eating grass because they're being fed this other way and how it makes them sick and then you have to give them antibiotics then not only are you getting the pesticides and the herbicides on the corn and the soy and the genetically modified ingredients you're also getting uh the, the all the antibiotics because the, the corn and soy makes the cow sick right so how important it is that it's grass-fed i also stop shy of the omega-3 omega-6 discussion which is what i was thinking that's why i want it to be grass-fed is because i want the omega-3s so anyway we're having this discussion and my daughter zoe's eyes light up now zoe zoe for is my gift child she's my most challenging child She's the biggest gift to me. She's the one who makes me grow the most. Um, and I've always suspected that she would turn into the biggest gift just because she's the hardest, right? And the, in my experience in life, the things that are the hardest tend to become the most rewarding. So I've always had an eye on Zoe of like, how's she gonna turn into the most rewarding? Cause mostly she's just the hardest. <laughs> um, but it's happening in front of my eyes. She's turning into the most rewarding. So. And I'm using the word most, like it's some kind of competition between my kids. Erase that, please. I didn't mean that. God, being a mother is so hard. Okay, anyway, Zoe's eyes light up. She gets a pad of paper and a pen, and she says, what are the healthy foods? Can we write them down? And Alexis chimes in, and she says, not all the healthy foods, but the ones that we usually keep in the house. And thus starts a couple hour melee in my kitchen of naming all the healthy foods. And then Zoe wants to categorize them. She gets my computer and we start to categorize them by fruit, vegetable, um, legume, nut or seed, protein, and fat. And like Zoe's already ahead of the game. She already knows that hummus is a legume and a protein. Avocado is a fruit, a vegetable, and a fat, right? And we're going food by food and she's asking, does this one fa fall into any other category? Spinach, it's a vegetable. And I'm like, yeah, it could be counted as, counted as a protein too. So we're writing all these foods. And um, Zoe says, at this point, Alexis got bored and she left. Maya was long since gone. Maya's six, she was out of the kitchen already. She had her pancakes, she took off. Um, Zoe's the only ones left. And Zoe says to me, how much of the food that's eaten is healthy? And I say, you mean like in the United States of all the food that's consumed, how much of it is what we would be calling healthy food? And I'm thinking organic, non-GMO, fits whole real food, not processed, fits into one of these categories. How much of the food that's eaten is healthy? And she's like, yeah, how much of the food that's eaten is healthy? And I said, what do you think? She goes, 45%? She says, I see people eating a lot of unhealthy stuff, a lot of candy. And I got down on my knees. So I was eye level with her. I said, Zoe, I think it's more like 5%. And her eyes got big. And I said, I got another one for you, Zoe. Of all the people that die every year, like in America, a lot of people die. Of all the people that die, how many of them died because of the unhealthy food they were eating? She said, 10%? I said, Zoe, I think it's about 70%. And 
She said, is that why you spent all that time doing bright line eating? And I said, Zoe, that's it, sweetie. You say sometimes I'm not around and you think I'm doing it to avoid you or because I don't love you. That's not what's happening, sweetie. I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to help people. And she said, could I help too? Could I help too? I want to help with bright line eating too. And I said, you want to help with bright line eating? And she said, yeah, I want to help with bright line eating. And I picked her up and I swung her around the kitchen and we cried. And I talked about the movies we could watch. There's a lot of movies, Zoe, Food, Inc., Cowspiracy, Supersize Me, Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. You want to see some movies with me? She's like, yeah, can we watch them all tonight? I said, no, we can watch one. Why don't you pick out the one that you want to watch the most? She said, okay. And she ran off to go vet movie trailers. (laughs) And then we have a family meeting every Wednesday night, and she wrote um, Healthy Eating on the family meeting agenda because she wanted to talk about it with her sisters. I've been waiting for a long time for my kids to develop their own interest in healthy eating. I've been not knowing how tight to toe the line of like not letting them eat those foods, only serving them these foods. It's just started in my house. My kids, independent, separately motivated, internally generated interest in healthy eating. And the fact that it dovetailed with like an understanding of why mommy works so hard, which is another thing that you know I struggle with, you know, the eternal working mom guilt. (laughs) Um, It's a pretty sweet day in the Thompson house. So thanks Monica Leggett for pointing out that I had a shoot a vlog on this. (laughs) Very astute of you. Thanks for tuning in. The saga continues. And if you're trying to raise kids who eat food in today's society, my heart breaks with you. It's not easy. I got no easy answers. But uh, thanks for letting me share this little slice of my story. I'll see you next week.